Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zed from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. You are having an awesome day. Well, that's awesome then, isn't it? It's like double awesome. Well, I hope you're all keeping well. Today I'm at the base camp. Now, if you saw my first video where I introduced the series, you can see that obviously I've done the initial recce of this location. Uh, and then to go away, think about, okay, how am I gonna approach this build? And so I've had a lot of time to think about this. I've spoken to a lot of my friends who are experts in a different array of things from actual bushcraft itself to green woodworking, etc. And so here's a conclusion that I've come up with. Initially, my idea was to go more along the primitive route um, and thinking about using strictly primitive tools, etc. Now, I spoke to primarily my friend Mance, who's the head instructor at Wilderness Pioneers. Uh, we had a long conversation, and obviously he really knows his stuff. He's built the most incredible primitive base camps. He knows primitive schools inside out. And I very quickly realized and appreciated more so that there's actually a lot that goes into building a primitive base camp, especially if you're gonna be using primitive skills. So here's what I've decided to do. I'm gonna build my base camp in two phases. The primitive base camp, based on primitive skills only, I'm gonna do it as the second phase down the line because there's a lot of learning I need to do for it and it's also gonna take a lot of time. At the moment in the UK, at the time of recording this video, we're in the middle of summer, we're just approaching August. And so before you know it, a couple of months are gonna pass and we're into autumn, i.e. fall, uh, and then winter. And so to build a primitive base camp, it's gonna take quite a while. And so what I've decided to do is leave that for the second phase down the line. So what am I gonna do for this first phase? You ask me, well, I shall answer. So what I'm gonna do for this first phase is build a more generic base camp using just traditional green woodworking techniques. And that hopefully I'll be able to build a lot more quicker. And for that, I'll use obviously modern tools like axes, knives, etc. And so what I wanna do in this video is kind of share with you what my thought is in terms of how I'm gonna build this. And I'm gonna keep it relatively simple. Um, and obviously it's gonna be using strictly natural uh, materials. So for example, natural cordage, obviously natural materials for the structure. So it's gonna be nothing artificial for the core structure itself. So let me share with you what I think I'm gonna be doing in order to build out my bushcraft base camp. So the first thing I need to do is apologize about the heavy winds. This is an extremely blustery day today. We had a lot of heavy rains, etc. recently, so I apologize about that. So if you recognize this location with this fallen beach, uh, this was a location, I've done my first wild camp at this location, just to kind of get myself acclimatized. And this is the location I've decided to build a base camp because it's a very good opening here. Now, a few things I need to run by you. So here, is a fallen beach. Now this is actually alive, I thought this was dead. But what it turns out is, for those of you in the UK will know, in the late 80s, in 1987, we had extremely heavy storms in the UK, it caused a lot of damage. Uh, and this actually supposedly fell down during then. And being such a resilient tree, it's actually dug its roots in and it's continued growing. Now you can see there. There you go. I'm trying to get my finger in the screen. So, if that was dead, I was gonna carve uh, some benches into that but alas this thing shall live forevermore so what this is going to be used for is a natural windbreak now along the back here is actually farmland okay and then here we get into the main woodland and so what I've decided to do is have the back of the shelter here so it's basically facing the back over there and therefore that obviously acts as a very solid windbreak because from there is where a lot of the wind is kind of coming towards towards the camera, towards me. So that's gonna act as a back. This is gonna act as a natural windbreak on the right hand side if you're facing out of the shelter. And then I may put a windbreak here as well, like make my own. So in terms of dimensions, let me walk you through what I'm gonna be doing in terms of dimensions. So in terms of the shelter, what have I decided I'm gonna be doing? Now obviously I'm gonna need your input also. So at the back is the farmland, open farmland. So that's where most of the wind is coming from. Ironically today, because it's quite a blustery day, it's a clear indication that I really need to block that up. So the back of the shelter is gonna be facing that way and then obviously the front is gonna be looking into the woodland, i.e. behind you. So on the right hand side, we've got the fallen beach here, which is gonna act as a natural wind break. Also use it as a bench without having to damage it. 
Um, and also the left hand side, I may put, a, you know, uh, make my own windbreak. Now in the front, I'm actually going to leave open. I know a lot of guys have done walls around their perimeter, and obviously it's each to their own. What I've decided at the moment that I'm going to go and, and not do that is because a lot of the work you're going to be doing at base camp is sitting down, you know, making fire and cooking and making stuff inside the base camp itself. And my opinion is I want to be able to look out into the woodland and not see walls. Do you understand? So, um, and I don't think I'm going to need it. Need the walls. Obviously, if down the line I decide I want to put walls and uh, as a perimeter, then obviously I'll go and do that. But for now, I'm going to keep the front completely open so I can look out into the woodland at my abode. So, in terms of the shelter, what have I decided I'm going to be doing? So, I'm going to build building a frame using sweet chestnut. Now, I can actually harvest the sweet chestnut from a part of this woodland where there's um, a coppice growing, a small coppice. Now, I'm looking at between two to three inches in diameter. That's what she said. Behave. So, I'm looking at two to three inches in diameter of sweet chestnut. Uh, I also got another friend that I'm currently speaking to. I may be able to uh, harvest it from his woodland because he actually coppices, as in processes sweet chestnut uh, for, gr uh, for building purposes. So, I'm going to be using a frame. Uh, using sweet chestnut. Uh, what I'm going to be doing with sweet chestnut is obviously harvest and fell the small uh, trees themselves responsibly and then going to debark them and then going to shape them up. So what I'm going to do is it's kind of a rectangle structure really. It's nothing complicated. The front poles and I'll use my Stanley measuring tape so each inch basically represents a foot. So the front poles, the front two behind me on the front are going to be seven feet because I'm five foot ten so obviously I need a kind of a decent clearing space above me and what I'm going to do is the if so if you're looking at the side of the shelter the front's going to be seven feet the back is going to be six feet so basically there's going to be a foot drop and obviously that's for the runoff for the rain and so it's going to be a very simple frame it's going to be just four pieces of sweet chestnut on the sides and then obviously beams to hold them together and then the front is going to be open and then what I'm going to do is the size, the back and the roof, I'm going to be using a hazel. So I'm speaking to a couple of people at the moment to go and copy hazel from them. Uh, it's a very simple material to use, uh, very readily available um, and you can responsibly kind of you know, uh, uh, um, harvest it without really causing any damage to the ecosystem. So I'm going to be using the hazels to build the sides. It's going to be bound together, especially the frame and the hazel, using natural cordage. I'm primarily going to be making from bramble and I'm also going to be using hopefully spruce roots from another woodland that I've got access to. And then once I've done that, you're probably thinking about the roof. So what am I going to be doing about the roof? Well, if you see my videos recently, I've done some natural college videos with Mance and his team over at Wilderness Pioneers based in Oxford here in the UK. And what they're experts at building a lot of primitive based shelters. And what they've done, they've built a small shelter to use as their wood store. And it was just incredible, even though it was on a small scale, quote unquote, uh, the techniques that they used to build that, to hold it together and the roofing, I found really fascinating. So when I was with them, I actually recorded a small video uh, talking to Mans and Mark, the co-instructor, about kind of how they built the shelter, uh, what were the things they were thinking when they built it. And I've used a lot of that as inspiration for my shelter. So. Let me interject that scene here where you can see me talking to those guys and get a better understanding of how they built their shelter. So let me introduce you, Mance and Mark over at Wilderness Pioneers. So gentlemen, both Mance and Mark, we were just talking about this small shelter that you made for your wood store. Mm -hmm. So just give me an overview of how you kind of built this, what the kind of structure is made from. Okay, the main structure is made from hazel. Okay. And the roof is made from cedar, western red cedar. Uh, the bark actually, uh, similar to, well, exactly the same as what you used or what I showed you how to make cedar cordage from. And the cordage inside is made from cedar bark. So just to kind of touch on a couple of aspects here as we were talking, so relevant to me learning about building base camp structures um, and obviously others that are watching. So with this roofing, obviously mm -hmm. water, it's preventing water. From kind of getting in. That's exactly so it. So yeah. with this one, you double layered um, the uh, the bark from red cedar. Yeah. So is this the kind of upper side here, and then you turned it the yeah. other way around underneath? Basically, we know the shape of bark is semicircular when we take it off. 
and it will inherently keep that shape. So if we just put these side by side, we'd have runoff sections in the middle here where all the rain would just end up coming down and dripping through. So like in the Mediterranean where they use a concave tile, they always invert one to catch the drippage coming off the outer surface. And that's what we did here, is we put one inverted so the rain will come off into this and act as a runnel and guide the water down off the, off the end. And Mark, you've tied these hazels on top to basically keep it in place, is that correct? Yeah. So these, um, if we were to leave the, without these, the, the rods across the top, the wind would get onto these and, uh, and fly them, make them fly. Um, we, so you could put a, a stick through, uh, we haven't used any nails or any screws on this mm -hmm. structure at all. Um, you could put a stick through and get it to, to tag in, but then of course uh, when the wind picks up it's likely to tear, pull through, um, and you've also of course um, got deliberately made an entry for water to get into. So the other way is to, uh, we put a stick, um, a long stick across the top and tied it in on both ends to uh, clamp it down um, into onto the structure itself. Uh, and we've done that top and bottom it just holds it in place. And obviously needless to say it's at a slant so the water will run off. Yeah, a, good, a decent slant uh, to get the water off as quickly as you can. Um, and the, um, the tail end, there's a lot of overhang there. Um, that's for um, a couple of reasons. The, um, the, the windward, the, the, the rain is going to come in from this angle. So to stop the, uh, the wood underneath from getting wet, we've uh, deliberately left this as quite a long tail. Interesting. Um, still allows the, the air in um, to, um, uh, to dry the wood out nicely but should keep uh, most of the weather off. Um, so you've got a, a decent overhang there. Um, if in time it does rot through and, and break off, so be it, it's, uh, it's not the end of the world. Uh, the main part is, is obviously the, the top of the shelter. And Red City has, um, what kind of properties did you say it was? Is it anti... Um... It has a higher oil content. Right. So because of that oil content, it rots away far slower than most other woods would. Um, so it's phenomenal for using it for roofing. Uh, vertical posts, um, mm -hmm. shingles is another classic use for it. Um, the American Indians or the First Nations people in America and Northern Canada used to make canoes out of it for exactly that reason, was that it was very slow rotting because of the high oil content. Perfect. Because building shelters, roofing is a big thing, isn't it? So yes, it's it about is. The water well, it's, for... it's the most important thing, isn't it? Yeah. Getting a decent roof on, which is going to protect everything underneath, whether it be you or whether it be a kit store, you've got to make it waterproof one way or another. And a couple of other things, okay, um, with shelter building. Um, I heard that when you have the wood sitting on the floor, it should ideally be seasoned so it doesn't start rotting. Um, is that the case? What's your experience with that? So, in essence, obviously the wood is touching the floor, mm -hmm. the kind of the stands, um, the rotting over time. It does slow it down, mm -hmm. but even seasoned wood is going to rot away, mm -hmm. no matter what, because anything that's in contact with wet moisture. Uh, damp ground is going to eventually rot. It's an organic material, it will decay. There are ways around it. Um, there's been evidence in um, early Neolithic man and Mesolithic where they would char the end of the log mm -hmm. before putting it into the ground and that slight carbon layer around it would stop, uh, slow down even further that rotting oh, interesting. process. Um, but we didn't do it on this one, did we Mark? No, we, we didn't. We, we just didn't. stuck it no. in. No. But the advantage we have, have you noticed? Yeah, it's, uh, it's growing. It's started growing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's not going to rot because it's a living thing. Um, so that will just continue growing now. Uh, hopefully all of them are doing it, but I know the front two are. So, as we know, a living structure isn't going to rot. And the other thing, and apologies about lighting here guys, I know it's getting quite dark now. Um, but it kind of ties underneath. So the middle one is essentially supporting. Yeah. So it's just sitting there. That's Have just you cut a little there. notch into there or? No, it's just sat there. That is just resting on top of there. And I think, did we create a peg for it? Yes, yes. Yep. So there's... There is a peg through that. Yep. 
Right, gotcha. Right, I'm sorry about the lighting, guys. It's quite dark in here right now. So we drilled a hole through it and right. then carved a peg from a uh, from a branch mm -hmm. and used those as nails rather than um, uh, sort of metal nails. Interesting. Um, and we did that on all of the the bit at the bottom as well. Um, um, and um, so where there's not a um, a natural um, cedar bark string cordage there we've used pegs uh, and drilled and tapped interesting uh, tap them in and one last thing I've noticed you use the actual natural shape of the wood here haven't you as yeah a, as a yeah I mean the, um, you can use a straight stick of, of course um, but you know if you're if you're harvesting um, a sapling like this um, it's gonna have forks and branches and what have you and that's by far the stronger way to support something is using the natural shape of the of the tree um, so it it makes sense to do it. it doesn't really make sense not to do it to be mm -hmm. honest agreed and the one final thing um you were talking earlier about the uh, thickness of cordage uh, depending yes. on the use that you're going to be yeah well, linking it back to your shelter as well um with the uh, cordage video making uh, I mean cordage making videos that we did with you uh, I've shown you a number of ways of making different thicknesses when you're building a big structure you need big, uh, big cordage and that's exactly what's going on here is rather than using thin or smaller strands we've just used a bigger quantity uh, of the initial strands and twisted them up to make thicker cordage perfect gentlemen thank you so much you're welcome, Zed. So there you go, you've seen what those guys have done. So it's pretty incredible. Even though it's technically a smaller structure, the principles are still the same when you build a bigger structure. And obviously they've used a cedar bark as tiling for the roof. And that's what I'm going to be hopefully doing with my one. So I'm speaking to a couple of people at the moment to harvest cedar bark. That's not available here at all in this particular woodland. So hopefully I can try and get sheets long enough pieces long enough so they go on the roof and go at an angle and they'll tile you know kind of like they'll sit like the cups into each other and hopefully it will make the top completely waterproof um, in the beginning what I'll do when I put the hazel roof on I may just put a cheap tarp on there just for the time being until I'm able to harvest some cedar bark and obviously once I get the cedar bark I'll remove the top and then put the cedar bark on top of it and so that's what I'm going to be doing for the main structure. So let me know your thoughts on that. I want to keep it really simple, but still using natural materials for the structure itself. Um, and so obviously I'm going to build that in three phases. First phase is obviously the sweet chestnut frame. Uh, second phase is obviously the hazel to build up the sides, the three sides and the roof. And then the fourth phase is obviously to get a cedar bark on the roof and to make it completely watertight. And hopefully, fingers crossed, that should be a solid structure to then build the actual main frame of the shelter with. So that's obviously the first phase of the base camp, building the shelter. I like I've explained that's in three components. So the next phase I then want to move on to once I've got that in place, but that's really the most important thing. And the second phase after that is to build the actual fire pit. So that, there's about three components to that. So in no particular order, it's digging out the fire pit itself. So I want to dig out, even though the soil is fine, a lot of it's clay mix, so it's perfectly fine to have a fire on here. I'm still going to dig probably around an inch or two inches deep um, and dig more of a rectangle or longer fire pit out. I've done a bit of research on that. And when the time comes, obviously I'll go into things in a lot more detail, but just to kind of cover it on a surface level now, I'm going to be doing a longer fire pit and that way you can manage kind of like your cooking a lot, lot better. Um, so there's going to be the digging out the fire pit, that's one phase. The second phase is going to be building the pot hanging system itself. Now obviously, you know, you do the generic wood ones, but I'm looking at something a bit more robust and a bit more longer term. So what I've decided to do is actually forge a very intricate pot hanging system. Now once again, when the time comes, I'll explain what I've got in mind. But what I'm going to be looking to do that is bring a blacksmith friend of mine. I'm talking to a couple at the moment and hopefully fingers crossed we'll be able to forge one here at the base camp which should be pretty cool and what I'm going to be doing is uh, forging a purpose-built pot hanging system something quite robust. Third component to the fire pit is building a fire reflector and a fourth component is actually building a stove and that is more for baking purposes. Um, so with that one obviously I'm still doing a lot of research uh, but that's the, those are basically the four components that I'm going to be doing. The fire pit, 
the uh, pot hanging system, the fire reflector, and a stove uh, to do some baking in. It's not gonna be a huge stove, it's gonna be something quite small. And so those are basically the four components to the fire pit and the fire area that I'm gonna be building as the second part of the series of my bushcraft base camp. And so the third and most important component of the initial phase, the overall phase of building out the base camp is the bed. Man, Zed's got to sleep somewhere, right? So we've got to build the bed. Now, obviously it's going to be a raised bed. It's going to be made out of wood. Um, maybe a hazel. Obviously that's once again readily available. Or it might be somewhere a little bit more kind of like luxurious. I'm not sure yet. I've still got to decide how I'm going to do that. And I'll think about that more when the time actually comes. So there you go, those are the three core components of getting the first overall phase of the bushcraft base camp built out. Number one, the core structure itself. Number two, the fire pit. Number three, the raised bed. Once I've got those three phases in, honestly, we're gonna be well and truly into autumn stroke fall. And so um, I need to have those three components in place. Once I have that in place, obviously autumn and fall, stroke fall is gonna come into play. And with that, obviously, you're going to get shorter daylight hours, uh, more temperamental weather, especially here in the UK. And so, you know, you're going to have loads of time to kind of do stuff in terms of building out the big, big things. So I want to get that done as soon as possible. Those three core components, um, I held up four fingers there, three components to get the core part of the base camp ready. And so once I have that in place, then throughout autumn and winter, I can then tinker away and get along with a whole raft of other kind of, uh, step down project so for example I'm going to build a dedicated woodworking area from that I want obviously want to make my own bowls and trays and and plates and cups and spoons and spatulas and cooksers and god knows what else right woodworking I just, I just want an excuse to build something out of wood so there's all of that um, obviously the baking and cooking is going to be a big thing um, and so obviously there's a whole raft of other things I'm going to be getting on with week by week month by month but by getting those three components in place that sets me up now, here's the thing, even though I've outlined kind of roughly what I'm going to be doing, obviously things change as you move forward. You try things out, and at the moment you realize, hang on a second, this is going to be good. But then when you get around to it, you realize, actually, I'm going to need to change my plan. And that's cool. You just work with it. Now, obviously, I've been doing a lot of research, speaking to a lot of people to get ideas and deciding on what kind of shelter I'm going to be building. Now, one of the channels I've been watching for quite a while but recently been watching a lot more and also speaking to the owner of the channel is a good friend of mine, John from the north of England, AKA Carlisle195. And I've mentioned it before on a previous video a while back and I just want to give him another shout out again. Um, that, guy, that guy is taking shelter building to a whole new level. Just to give you an idea of the craziness that guy gets up to. At the moment he's building a three tier shelter. Let me repeat that, a three tier shelter. You never heard that wrong. And it's insane. And the guy is phenomenal. He's just going leaps and bounds with his shelter building. And honestly, I've been getting so much inspiration from watching his channel. Um, I'm gonna put a link below and I would really encourage you to go and check out John's channel. There's two things he does like no other man on YouTube, literally. Number one, shelter building. The guy's like a one man building machine. And secondly, cooking. No one, I repeat, no one comes close to the type of cooking this guy does on his channel. He's actually a professional chef. And trust me, when you watch him, whether you eat or whether you're not eating, you're gonna be hungry by the time you finish watching this video. The guy eats like a king. And he's really thin, he's like me, he's really, really slim. I don't know where all the calories goes. Seriously, the guy has like three, four course meals. So um, definitely go and check out John's channel, AKA Carlisle195. I'll put a link below in the description. Honestly, you will not be disappointed. Uh, you'll be blown away by the kind of shelter building and the kind of base camp he's building out, which is just like my base camp on steroids. And secondly, if you see his cooking, his cooking is off the charts. So I've been speaking to him a lot. He's been very kind to kind of give me a lot of advice and help. And obviously I've been learning a lot from his channel. So definitely go and check out his channel, Carlisle195, and tell him that I sent you over. So there you go. This video was to kind of give you the overview of what I'm proposing now I'm going to be building here at my base camp. Needless to say, if you have any thoughts and suggestions all along the way, please do go and let me know in the comments below or via PM. And honestly, I'm all ears. I'm the first to admit, I just know what I know. It's very basic. 
and obviously there's a lot of you have way more experience than I do and if you, if you don't have a lot of experience it doesn't matter still if you've got an idea let me know I'm all ears so like I said to repeat it's going to be in three phases so the first component is to build the actual uh, shelter itself number two to build a fire pit number three is to then build the raised bed once I have those three in place really the core part of the base camp is in place and then from there I can start developing out further and really start elaborating on the base camp i'm really excited i've got so much cool stuff planned for this base camp that i'm really eager to get on with things now now the one thing i will add the reason why i've been a little bit slow getting on with this base camp is i injured my ankle quite badly my left ankle about two three months ago um and it's kind of went from bad to worse. Now, I don't really talk about my personal stuff on video, but I thought I needed to explain. That's the reason why I've been a little bit slow getting out. Um, obviously, I, I was planning to get out for two, three nights at a time, get loads and loads of stuff done. But because of this ankle, I can't really get out for more than one day. Um, and so I'm not saying, telling you that to kind of pull out the violins. I'm just telling you that's the reason why I have to kind of ease off so I can still get on with stuff, but I've got to slow down quite a bit. Um, and so that's why... I really want to get the first three components done within about a month, within about six weeks. But realistically, it's probably going to take obviously longer than that. But I don't want it to be too long. So I thought I'd mention that just in case you're wondering why I haven't been getting on with stuff. So that's the reason why. So you're going to be obviously seeing things now fold out piece by piece, week by week here on my channel. And as always, I, I've mentioned this many times before. But if you're not following me on Instagram, please do go and check me out. Just search for Z Outdoors. The moment you see a dodgy looking Asian bloke with a broken nose, then you know you found me. Follow me on there because I document a lot of stuff on there. I'm not documenting here on YouTube. So by following me on both platforms, you get a really good overview of what I get up to. So there you go. That is the overview. So please do go check out Carlisle195. My buddy John is doing some phenomenal stuff on his channel. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button and tell him that I sent you over. Link below in the description. And please do go check out the guys over at Wilderness Pioneers. They've been a huge help to me to really inspire me and guide me and advise me along the way in terms of things I should be doing and not doing. Once again, a link to the channel below. Please do go check those guys also. And if you have any thoughts, comments and suggestions, let me know in the comments below and I'm all ears. So once again, I'm grateful that you're on this journey with me. A lot of cool stuff now uh, being planned to get this base camp built out. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week. This is Zeph from Zell Outdoors. Peace out.